Okay, I want everybody in the room to imagine that next year you move to California. Okay, I want everybody to picture that in your heads. Oh, we got some applause already. Okay, now, how would you feel in California? Would it make you happy? Do you think you might be happier in California? Yeah. <laughs> now, I want you to hold on to that thought because I'm going to talk to you today about future thinking, how we think about the future and what that means and how we sometimes screw it up. So hold on to that thought because we're going to return to it. Um, what I just asked you to do is to think about a possible future. Now, one of the amazing things about being a human being is that we can do this at all. Okay? No other animals that we know of can really think about and picture something happening in the future. We can also think about things in the past. Now, I'm a professor, and uh, I've got a meeting next week on Wednesday. I just got an email that says that the meeting's been pushed forward two days. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you think the meeting is now on Friday. Now raise your hand if you think the meeting's on Monday. Okay, so we see that people differ about this, right? We, the, and it turns out that the answer that you give depends on your relationship that you, uh, with time that you have. So the people who say that the meeting pushed, Wednesday meeting pushed forward two days is on Friday, they tend to see themselves as moving through time, as though time were sort of a static air or something that they're moving through. And people who say that the meeting is on Monday see themselves as more stationary with time flowing over them, okay? Um, so when we think about things in time, when we think about the past, we know we can make mistakes with that. So you might have uh, experienced something with a friend and you differ on what happened. So we're all pretty familiar with that. What we don't think about a lot is how we make mistakes about thinking about the future. But the science of psychology has shown that we actually are pretty systematic in the ways that we screw up thinking about the future. So today I'm going to tell you about what those screw ups are so that you, when you think about your own future world, you can be uh, better about thinking about it. Now, the first thing I'm going to go over is that um, when you think about the past, you put yourself into the past, you put in a lot more details than when you think about the future. So this uh, next picture here is my birthday party and uh, my last birthday party. And so I can remember um, there were 43 candles on the cake. And uh, you can't see it from the picture, but uh, inscribed on it was light years and light years, try not to shed no tears. So I, I can remember things about my birthday party, details about it. And likewise, if I were to ask you, about your last birthday party. You might remember where it is or who was there. You might remember your fear that people would think that you're the kind of person who wouldn't wear a green suit. You know, all these details <laughs> of the birthday party. Now, if I, imagine you to, uh, if I ask you to imagine your birthday party two years from now, okay, if you're like most people, it, it ends up being pretty generic and stereotypical. When we think about things in the future, we remove details and we tend to think about more generic and stereotypical ways that lack those details. Now, you might think, well, of course, how would we know those details? They haven't happened yet. Right? But it's deeper than that because they've done an experiment where they ask people to imagine a car accident. Okay? And some people were asked to imagine a car accident that had already happened. And other people were asked to imagine a car accident that would happen. And even in this condition, people put more detail into the imagined car accident in the past than in the future. That's weird, right? They're both completely imaginary. <laughs> They're not happening or going to happen, but just the very suggestion that it's going to be in the future makes it more vague to people. Now, once an event already happens, then we can put in those details. But since we don't imagine them when we picture the future, we don't plan for them, and that can be a problem. All right, next imagination exercise. I want you to imagine going camping. Everybody imagine going camping. I'm a scientist who studies imagination, but I cannot go into the audience and tell you what you're imagining. But I will hazard a guess at some of the things that you are probably very likely not to imagine. So first, you're not imagining wondering where that sleeping mat was and you lent it to that girl and did she ever return it? You're not imagining sitting in front of a half-packed trunk and shouting up to your girlfriend on the second floor asking if she'd already packed the lantern. You're not picturing trying to grill chicken in the rain. And nobody is probably imagining all the dishes you have to do once you get back. Now, is it that when we imagine something in the future, we're not picturing the bad things? No, that's not quite it either. If you think camping is an overall positive experience, when you think about it, doing it in the future, you tend to think about the good things and you gloss everything with goodness. And we do the opposite with bad things. So something that you just think is bad, I'll throw up maybe doing laundry, you don't like doing laundry. When you think about doing laundry in the future, you don't think about any of the good things. In fact, some of you are probably thinking, what are the good things about doing laundry? But what about the nice, the feel of the sheets when you pull them out of the dryer? 
or the smell of your clothes as you're putting them away. You know, there are some neutral and positive parts of doing laundry, but we don't think of those things. Now, the problem with this is that if we don't imagine details, we are very bad at imagining how long it's going to take us to do something. This is called the planning bias, OK? So let's say that you got to print out a document. I emailed you a document. You print it out. How much time are you going to allow yourself to do that? Well, you think, oh, that's easy. You just open it, hit print, pull it out of the printer. That's always that easy, right? Well, sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Um, what you're not thinking about is um, how uh, the printer's on the fritz and uh, the toner's out, and then there's another piece of, there's another toner package in your, and, but is that one empty? Were you supposed to return that to recycling, or is that one actually full? Or, oh, it's in open office and I can't open it in Word, or I need to edit it, but then I need to change the permissions first because I can't edit it the way it is, or so I need to figure it, and I gotta Google how to, right? Those things could happen, but we never think about it, and so we end up chronically overcommitting ourselves, okay? That's one way that we overcommit ourselves. That's the planning bias. Now, um, in computer programming, there's this idea of Hofstadter's law. And Hofstadter's law is that any computer programming project will take three times as long as you think it will, even if you take into account Hofstadter's law. <laughs> now, planning for the future is also a problem because our schedules look really clear in the future. So think about next week, what you're doing next week, OK? Probably pretty busy, right? What about a year from now? Oh, there's nothing. Calendar's totally free. So if somebody asks you, would you do something, would you uh, host the next TEDx a year from now? You're like, oh, sure, I'm not doing anything. We forget that we are, we're going to be just as busy with a zillion things that are inevitably going to come up then. And then we're going to be like, why did I ever commit to this? Has this happened to anybody? This happens to me. You commit to something, right. So what's going on here, um, we end up chronically overcommitted. And we're, in a way, compromising our future self, OK? Uh, in many ways, we think of our future selves as different people. We don't care about them as much as we care about ourselves. And we're will willing to put uh, the onus on them, right? And this is why we overspend and why we overeat and we do things like this. Let the future self worry about the weight gain. That's what, we, that's what goes through our heads. Uh, in one study, people were asked, would you rather go see a, a kind of a dull lecture across the hall or a really interesting lecture across town? You'd have to go all the way across town or whatever. Now, people gave different answers if it was about tomorrow or if it was about a year from now. If it was tomorrow, they're like, oh, God, I don't have time to go. I don't have time to go. I'll watch the dull lecture across the hall tomorrow. <laughs> but for the future self, they're like, oh, yeah, let's go to the interesting lecture, right? Let the future self do the commute, right? <laughs> this is how we, <laughs> we make these problems. Now, some people differ in this. Now, some people are very future-oriented and others are more past-oriented. And the more future-oriented people feel more of a kinship with their future selves and they treat them better. Okay? They're more likely to um, exercise, uh, they save more money, and uh, even future-oriented people even make more pro-environmental choices, right? Because they're, they're sacrificing themselves a little bit now for something good in the future. Now, how can you make yourself more future-oriented? Well, there is one concrete way to do that, and that is to very vividly picture what you're going to be like in 20 or 30 years. Okay? What are you going to be like? What's your, what are you going to weigh? What's your face going to look like? Uh, how much money are you going to have in the bank? Where are you going to be working? Right? All these things. And then try to see the connection between that and the, and the soda pop you're drinking or, the, or the, you know, the money you're spending, that kind of thing. Now, another way that we mess up thinking about the future is that we tend to um, make mistakes about how we're going to feel. We have these predictions about how we're going to feel that we don't get them quite right. So I want you to think again. Think of a restaurant you love and your favorite dish there and you're eating your favorite dish. And the manager comes over and says, for whatever reason, hey, you've won a prize. You can have 10 meals here free. Oh, great, right? OK, but you got to pick them all now. I want you to choose what you're going to eat for all those meals right now. Now, most people in the room would be like, well, I don't want to have my favorite dish every time, right? So I'll pick a variety. I'll have maybe the dish a few times, but I'll sprinkle it in with some other things. Wrong. People will put in variety whether they're going to have those meals in the next 10 days or whether they're going to have one meal every three months. It makes sense in the next 10 days, but not in every three months. Because what happens is, if you have it every three months, by the time the three months is up, you're going to be ready for your favorite dish again. Right? You, you, so you need variety only if the, the, they're packed in with time. Okay? And people don't really understand this, so they make some bad choices because they don't understand the relationship between infrequency um, and, and uh, novelty and their own happiness. So that's one way that we um, get emotions wrong in the future. 
We also tend to overestimate the emotional impact of future events. And what this means is that um, we tend to think bad things in the future are going to feel way worse than they do. And we also tend to think future, uh, future good things are going to feel way better than they do. We overestimate that. Part of this is because of focus. Now, when I asked you uh, how happy you'd be if you moved to California, most people think, yeah, I'd be really happy if I moved to California. And I'll tell you what's going on. They think of the one most salient thing that's different <laughs> between where they are living now in California. And what is that? The weather. The weather, right. So they picture themselves, oh, I'm on Venice Beach, and it's sunny, and I'm happy. <laughs> yes, I would be much happier in California, right? Wrong again, OK? <laughs> You neglect all of the other things that make you happy or sad. So your friends and uh, your, your health and your relationship with your spouse and all this. In fact, let me, I'll let you in on a secret. 60% of your happiness is genetic. You have no control over 60% of your happiness. It has nothing to do with it. Okay. It turns out that weather actually has very, very little effect on your happiness. So you're very likely to be just as happy or just as miserable as you are right now if you were to move to California. It's just, it's still you after all. <laughs> now, I know some of you are thinking, that can't be right. 60%, give me a break, right? But even the skeptics in the audience probably know somebody who's got the greatest life in the world, nothing wrong, and they're always grumping and moaning, miserable people. And you might also know some people who've got terrible lives, full of hardship, and they're just always chipper and happy. Okay? It is just part of our cultural belief that your happiness is caused by what happens to you, and it's just not true. It's just not true. In fact, they've done studies of people who win the lottery and people who get hurt badly and need to be in a wheelchair the rest of their life, and it doesn't affect their long-term happiness. Three months. They get a boost or a downward slope for three months, and then what happens? They return to the level of happiness that they always were at. It's as though each of us has a thermostat for happiness that we return to when we habituate to whatever our new lifestyle is. And people don't, people don't realize that. In fact, so a significant portion of people who have trauma, go to prison, have terrible accidents, they actually claim that the, it ultimately made them happier. People reconstruct their happiness in their own lives. And it's a very alluring thought. It affects your thinking about the future, though, because sometimes when you're feeling down, you might try to figure out what's wrong. Why am I feeling so down? Well, maybe I need to lose 10 pounds. Or maybe I need, a, a ra I need that promotion. Or I need a raise or something like that. And you th how many people know somebody, or maybe you, you're five pounds away from happiness all the time, right? <laughs> so you lose those five pounds. People tend to focus on these material things that just don't work. And there's a cost there because they're not focusing on the things that do work, like exercise and meditation and especially social interaction are things. Th those are things you can do to actually affect the 40% of things that you have any control over. Right? So in summary, I want you to remember, things take longer in the future than you think they're going to. <laughs> things are not nearly as happy or as awful as they're going to be, as they're going to feel in the future. Your future self is still you, so please take good care of her. And finally, you're just as happy, you'd be just as happy in sunny California as you are where you live right now. Thank you.